2013 webinar, part of the Smart Irrigation Month webinar series, Bringing Water to Life. This webinar is focusing on changing how we irrigate and taking advantage of incentives to help farmers upgrade irrigation technologies. We have two great speakers on this webinar today. Really excited to hear what they have to say and appreciate you taking some time out of this holiday season to join us for our final 2013 webinar. Uh, before we start the webinar, the, the really bulk of the webinar, I want to talk a little bit about the Irrigation Association for those of you who do not know. We are a trade association whose mission is to promote efficient irrigation, and we do that through four strategic initiatives. And the list of those four are right there. This webinar series is really focusing on the benefits of efficient irrigation and the benefits of irrigated agriculture, and really tying that down to the producer level, public policy, public opinion about irrigation, best ways to do efficient irrigation, et cetera, kind of tying that up in a bow and presenting it, focusing on different topics throughout the year. It's part of our public affairs efforts within our strategic initiatives. Give a brief overview about the webinar. Like I said, we have two panelists that will, that will begin their presentation shortly. And for those of you who are interested in asking questions, there are, there's a question box on our GoToWebinar panel that's on your screen. If you have any questions for either speaker during their presentations, please type that question into that box. I will be collecting those questions throughout the presentations and will moderate a Q&A session at the very end of the webinar. I will also share the email addresses of our two panelists. So if you have any questions post-webinar for either me or Dan or Dana, please feel free to reach out to any of us, and we'll be more than happy to get back in touch with you to clarify anything, to go more in depth, further information, et cetera. We're also recording this webinar, and it will be available in a few days on the Irrigation Association's website, and I'll share that link with you at the end of the webinar as well. But first, I wanted to kind of set the stage for the discussion we're having about incentives and investing in efficient irrigation for ag producers. And really focusing first on the challenge that we see before land and water. Uh, according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, more than four-fifths of ag production, ag, ag production growth to 2050 is expected to come from increased productivity on presently cultivated land. That means we need to do more with what we have in front of us right now. And to do that, we need to invest in technologies to make that happen. However, as you can read on the screen right here, global investment in land and water management remains below the levels necessary to address this food insecurity and deal with our natural resource scarcity. And unfortunately, I fear that the more we head down this road of meeting the needs for, for the current and future generation and produce a safe and reliable food supply here in the United States while meeting all the environmental concerns, the United States is going to fall into this into this realm of not investing enough. And we need to look for ways to invest more. And one of the ways is through incentives. And do these, do these, do these incentives work? Should we be doing more? What are we getting out of these incentives? What are hey, available to us right now? Uh, yes, Dan. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I can't, do you have a PowerPoint you're running right now? Yes, I do. I can't see it. I'm not sure if uh, others. Sorry, let me get, uh, let me get, I, I apologize to everybody. There we go. Thank you, Dan. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. Thank you, Dan, very much. Sure. Um, so as you can see, global investment in land and water management remains below the levels necessary to address persistent food insecurity and deal with natural, natural resource scarcity. So I appreciate that, Dan, and we'll continue on with the webinar now. And perfect timing for you to see my screen because I have a chart right here that I wanted to share with you looking at the evolution of land under irrigated and rain-fed cropping. So this looks at the amount of uh, the amount of agricultural hectares per person globally. So in 1961, you can see in million hectares the amount of, of agricultural land available per person. You can see it's 0.45 million hectares per person in 1961. In 2008, that had gone down to between 0.2 and 0.25 hectare per, per person. So over time, that has gone down tremendously, which again necessitates the need to do more with the land we have available to us right now. 
I know Dan with the NRCS is going to talk uh, talk about EQIP, but big picture, want to look at where EQIP funding is right now in the United States. So authorized levels is 2008 Farm Bill. I'm not even going to talk about what's in the new Farm Bill until it passes and signed into law. But in the 2008 Farm Bill, you'll see from fiscal year 2008 through fiscal year 2012, uh, the amount of money that was authorized to go to EQIP. And then once that goes to the appropriation level, it has some changes in the mandatory spending. So in 2008, there was a decrease by $200 million to $1 billion. And you can see each year that has decreased uh, per fiscal year, fiscal 2012 has it had a $350 million decrease off of what was authorized down to $1.4 billion. If you add up all those red numbers right there, that's a difference of $1.33 billion of what Congress originally authorized to equip to what was appropriated to equip. And that's more than fiscal years 2008, 2009, uh, Fiscal year 2008-2009, amount of money that was given to them, that was authorized to them, and fiscal year 2008, 9, 10, and 11 was appropriated to them. So that's like another year of funding that was taken away for other purposes from EQIP. Now before I give it to Dan, I wanted to talk about five findings from the USDA's Economic Research Service from a study they did in 2008 about irrigated agriculture in the United States. first finding was that irrigators continue to make significant investments in new and improved irrigation systems. Uh, approximately $2.15 billion was invested in irrigation systems in 2008, 2008 a 92% increase over investments for 2003. That's a huge increase, and we're looking to see what that's going to be and once the new numbers come out here shortly through this study of what it's been for the past five years from 2008 through 2013, where, I must, where we can assume that this funding and this interest and this investment has continued on this track because of the interest in becoming more efficient with water use in agriculture. The second finding was that most on-farm irrigation investment is financed privately. Less than 10% of farms reported financing irrigation improvements in 2008 through public financial assistance programs. However, nearly 50% of the farms that receive financial assistance for irrigation technology did so through the EQIP program. Irrigated farms participating in EQIP represented only about 4% of farms making irrigation investments in 2008. So you can see that farmers are interested, but it's still a very small percentage out of EQIP overall of what's going to efficient irrigation. Finding three. Over time, equip funding has had an important, important impact on irrigation investments, amounting to $1.4 billion from 2004 through 2010, and this accounted for roughly a quarter of equip's funding obligations, $5.7 billion during 2004 through 2010. The fourth finding was less than 10% of irrigated farms use advanced on-farm water management decision tools, such as soil or plant more moisture sensing devices, commercial irrigation scheduling devices, or computer-based crop growth simulation models. It also found that the sustainability of irrigated agriculture may depend partly on the willingness and the ability of producers to adopt irrigation production systems that more effectively integrate improved water management practices with efficient irrigation application systems. And then finally, the fifth finding was that ag water conservation is both a farm and basin level resource conservation issue, which I'm sure Dan will talk about in her presentation, and integrated the use of improved on-farm irrigation efficiency with state and federal watershed water management tools encourages producers to recognize and respond to differing values of water across competing uses, improving the potential for sustainable irrigation while facilitating water reallocation to other uses. So with those five findings in mind, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dan Johnson. Dan is, uh, is the California State Water Management Engineer for the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, out of his state office in Davis, California. He's a registered agricultural engineer and a graduate of Cal Poly in St. Louis Obispo, California. 
uh, Dan is responsible for the technical aspects of the agency's irrigation assistance to producers statewide and has been with the NRCS for 35 years. So Dan, I am going to throw the presentation over to you right now. And you should have it. <clears throat> Am I up? You're up. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, everybody. I, uh, again, I appreciate this opportunity um, uh, to, to learn from the rest of you and, and uh, to hear what the Irrigation Association is up to with the webinars and so forth. But uh, just one thing I need to make, say up front is that I actually work out of California, and, and although I like to represent the NRCS nationally, I mean, Obviously, I'm gonna, you're going to hear my perspective, or our, our California's perspective, on uh, the equipment program. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of you are fully aware that uh, EQIP is national, and so it, it looks very similar uh, ac across the country. And mine just went down. So bear, bear with me. All right. Um, so yeah, so I'll give California's perspective on it. Um, I'd like, I was hoping to put a picture in here of me so you can see all of me, so if you, you meet me sometimes, you can recognize me, but I thought I'd do you a favor and just show you my hands, so next time I see you at a conference, you can look for these hands. I'll do, uh, uh, cover three things. One is talk about the ECA program in general and, and what it's doing for us, um, and a little bit about the need to look at the big picture as we kind of stand back and look at how, how is it working for us. And thirdly, along the same lines of how is it working for us, is, to, uh, is, there, is there a way to get more out of it? And again, these are some things we've been working on in California. Uh, first of all, what is it? Just for those that aren't familiar with it. it is, uh, it's one of the conservation provisions of the Farm Bill, as uh, we just heard uh, John describe. Uh, provide financial assistance to producers to apply conservation practices. And, in NRCS, as if you're not aware, we work with producers on all many types of resource issues from wildlife, air quality, water quality, including water conservation. But of course, today, most of my talk would be in the context of, of irrigation. Um, but first of all, I just want to, just as a reminder, you know, why are we doing this? What is NRCS's interest in, in providing financial assistance and incentives for irrigation, the irrigation practices? And uh, because that's that's the context of, of you know if we evaluate are we doing achieving what we hope to achieve, and the way I like to describe it is we're helping producers get better control over their irrigations. Um, you know I show a picture here of fertile irrigation, not to suggest there's no control there, but uh, as folks that work with irrigation long enough, you know if you do surface irrigation, uh, you're pretty pretty much at the whim of the soil of distributing water. Uh, and it's the same is true if, in regards to having conveying di conveyance ditches that get water to the field that are, are not lined uh, or otherwise have a high seepage rate. Uh, the other aspect of, of control is uh, not just uh, how water is distributed on the field, but the farmer's ability to control how much stays in the root zone. So irrigation scheduling is, is right up there, uh, same level of importance as the hardware. More specifically, um, we want to reduce water loss. Now, others may have called this water conservation, and that's fine. Uh, but there's sometimes there's different connotations and understanding about what conservation means. So, I prefer and most of this in California. We talk about reducing water loss. I guess that's the engineer in me. Uh, we like to talk in terms that you can you can point your finger at. So, okay, here's a source. Here's something we can fix. So, we're trying to reduce those leakages and in, in, essentially in the system. Uh, secondly, and this is really this is large in California, uh, reduce fertilizer, pesticide, and sediment leaving the field. The way the producer handles his water, uh, they can handle uh, contaminant movement, whether it be sediment, pesticides, or fertilizers. California nitrates in groundwater uh, is is a, a huge issue, and it's one of our driving forces. Um, with uh, with, with better control, the farmer himself has better control or more flexibility to, pers to respond to what may come up, and specifically to interruptions in water supply. And of course, we are all familiar with drought. Uh, drought is, is uh, will, drought will come and go, and uh, the more uh, flexibility the farmer has over how he applies his water, where he has con control over uniformity and, and, and reducing losses, 
uh, uh, they can be more successful in farming. And finally, uh, the possibility to reduce energy consumption. And I use the word possibility, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit later. But certainly, if you are more efficient, as, as is stated, and you, and you pump less water, you will, will use less energy. So how does an EQA program work? Uh, farmers that uh, want to, want to, would like to participate, the, the land in question of interest uh, has to be currently irrigated. In fact, by our policy, it needs to be irrigated three out of the last five years. Uh, funds, um, the, amount, the, the amount that we will assist with, uh, will pay about half the cost of installing the practice, uh, but generally speaking. Uh, we do have other categories uh, to, follow, to pay higher percentages, but generally speaking, we, we talk in terms of, of being able to be able to fund about half the cost. Uh, all the funds are competitive. Uh, projects with the greatest environmental benefit, as we, as we say, are given priority. So we have a very systematic ranking process where we'll take all applications from a number of farmers and, uh, and we'll rank them so it's competitive. Uh, the rate of environmental benefits, the very high priority to get funded. And finally, um, is uh, we don't do this in a vacuum. NRCS does not do this in a vacuum, it's administrative. Uh, we, have, uh, we seek a lot of it at the local level, at the state level, and, and nationally, of course. Um, you know, soil and water conservation districts, other state and federal agencies, uh, NGOs or environmental organizations, ag organizations, uh, you know, Farm Bureau Federation and others, we seek their input on how we structure the program and how to prioritize and specifically, you know, what resource concerns are we specifically trying to address. Program benefits, um, it, you know, it just what it does for us. So certainly, and you can see the practices there, there's a lot of pipelines, pivot systems, sprinkler systems. Um, so the, the greatest benefit is we are, we're assisting getting more of those out on the ground, assisting producers. And just to give you a number to work with, last year uh, we assisted over 2,000 producers in California, uh, and just with the irrigation part of it. So there's, uh, we've, we touch a lot of people each year. Um, the other benefit is, uh, it, this is our participation. You know, NRCS maintains a high level. Of, you know, we have practice standards um, where we, you know, assist. With, I think we have a role in nationally in in assuring that there's a high level of quality uh, that the farmers receive from vendors and, and manufacturers, and they've done a great job. Uh, they're great partners in working with us, as well as uh, the National Association, ASABE, and so forth, on setting those standards. And just by our role. In offering the program, we're able to spread those even to non-cost share projects. So uh, we think that's an important benefit. And finally, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, NRCS does a lot of things, and we have a lot of interest in other resource concerns. And farmers have interest in other resource concerns. So by essentially by assisting with the say with the irrigation system, it allows us to say get our foot in the door to, to develop a longer conversation with the farmer to see if there are other opportunities that will benefit them as, as well as the environment. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, this is Mr. Ramos. Uh, this last year he converted eight, eight acres of uh, surface irrigated uh, grapes to drip. And uh, it's always interesting to hear their perspective of what the, what the value of what we saw benefited it. And his, his description is he no longer has to push his water across the field, and which, is, which is a real issue in sandy soils. Anytime somebody says they have to push water across the field, that means you're getting too much water soaking in the top of the field. So that was his description. Uh, the other benefit we saw here is uh, uh, the, the value to us is, uh, although it doesn't show it here, but he's uh, we will be tilling his middles less um, for weed control and other operations. So in this particular area in California, uh, air emissions, the air quality, dust is an environmental concern. So this is an opportunity to reduce uh, tractor work, tractor passes, and keep dust down. So again, we're continually trying to see multiple benefits for projects. Uh, Mr. Atwell, was, he's, uh, he is very interested, uh, an interesting gentleman. Uh, he was just almost tickled pink. He was so excited about his, his micro-irrigation system. Um, uh, you know, his, his statement was after he installed the system again with financial assistance uh, that he, since his water applications were cut in half, and, and it's interesting with uh, with micro irrigation. You, you, you hear that commonly, especially in advertisements. And, and this time, it was after the case. Uh, we don't typically find that much, but in, 
you know, many times we'll see anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, but it is significant, especially in heavy texture, or I should say sandy soils. So he was quite excited. For particular interest to, to, to me is, you know, my strong interest is, as we move ahead in California, irrigation scheduling. And uh, I think Mr. Atwell is a good example of, after working with us for a little bit more, in addition to his hardware, uh, he decided that he wanted uh, to get his feet wet, if you will, with, air, with soil moisture monitoring. And so he was, uh, we assisted him with installing some, some equipment throughout his field. And uh, I'd love to go out and meet with him some more to see actually how he's using the data. And that's the, our next big challenge is, this, uh, is making good use of the data that they're collecting. The other thing you mentioned, and it was just off the cuff, is that uh, he doesn't have to fertilize as much. We may have remembered earlier I talked about uh, nitrates and groundwater are the key problem in California. And so when we hear something like that, it's just like music to our ears. There's no better uh, testimonial to say, okay, what we're doing is, is making a difference. So with his uh, co better control over his irrigation, uh, he's not leaching as much nitrogen. So, of course, that's money in his pocket uh, having to purchase less. The other uh, uh, form of, of EQIP, and we heard John describe, was the Agricultural Water Enhancement Program, Enhancement Program, or AWEP. And it, it's, it was a great opportunity uh, for partners. Uh, the program is, uh, was administered by NRCS, and essentially from a farmer's perspective, it looks just like EQIP. We thought we go through the same process of ranking and so forth and selection. The difference is these are the, the, the projects are sponsored and proposed by local groups, uh, watershed groups, irrigation districts, uh, resource conservation districts, or others that have a common resource concern they would like to, enter, uh, to address. So with this uh, uh, process, they're able to uh, seek, seek and get additional funds uh, to focus on their, their constituents or their clients within their, within their working area. And all the funds are, are passed straight through to producers. The pro and the proposals are, are submitted, are selected, and uh, approved nationally. So NRCS, we administer it, but we, we have the states don't uh, have a, a major role in the selection process. In California, we've, we're, we have or are finishing up 15 AWIP projects throughout the state. And I'll give you one example. Uh, this is the, the San Joaquin uh, River Water Quality Project, AWET project. Um, it's 1.5 million acres in a three-county area in, in the central part of California. And their focus was water quality, surface, specifically surface water quality. So with surface irrigation, uh, irrigation runoff is, is, a, is, a, is very common, in fact, necessary for good uniformity. Uh, but many times it's carrying sediments and other contaminants off the soil from farming operations. So with uh, the program, and specifically we, uh, we were able to apply practices um, in one particular year in 2010 uh, of the five-year project, uh, they had, we had uh, 19 producers that uh, participated for the irrigation practices, and they applied improvements over about 1,300 acres. Uh, some of those the key systems were tailwater recovery systems, and, and is very popular in California, 14 micro-irrigation systems. Uh, so to, again, tail rod recovery to, to keep soil on the property and water on the property. And then with micro-irrigation, which does not gener generate runoff, we're able to keep soil and pesticides and, and nutrients in place. Uh, with, this, with these projects, uh, with this particular project, it, they, it was conducted in, in coordination with a, um, a, a state regulatory program, water quality regulatory program with coalitions. And these coalitions are actually doing self-monitoring of, of river systems within their boundaries. And so within this, with this river system, uh, and with their monitoring program, they're seeing progress. And uh, although we're not with these projects, EQIP's not responsible for all of the improvements, but they, are, they do play a significant role. So it is, it's nice to see specific numeric uh, um, benefits from uh, implementation of, of programs. Now, just a little change. Uh, so that's, that's the benefits. That's we've uh, to give you some examples of, of what we've done with EQIP. Um, but something I'd like to bring up a couple of things. One is uh, what we call an EQIP program check. You know, we have these programs in place and have had them for some time. But every once in a while, we need to take a look at it and see how we're doing. 
And one of the uh, challenges, or not challenges, but the concerns that they have come up and that, uh, that we need to be cognizant of is uh, to make sure that uh, we're doing all positive things out there and not negative. Um, one example, uh, energy. As I mentioned earlier, with water management practices, uh, there's potential to reduce energy consumption because you can essentially re pump less water. Well, that's true unless you're converting, say, from a service irrigation supply, converting to a pressurized or a pump system. So in that case, you actually are pumping where you didn't before. And so when we have situations like that, uh, we need to evaluate. Um, and we need to stop and say, okay, are we having a net benefit here? We're conserving water, perhaps, but are we using more energy? And, uh, and we're, we're at, we actually are looking into that in California right now. We think we're fine. Uh, in fact, there's been no red flags before, but we need to be able to describe and say that, yeah, we have looked at it, and we may conclude that we need to make some changes. Maybe it's geographically, uh, but we need to take a look at it and be aware of it. Second is groundwater. And this is something we have to take a close look at. So again, if you're switching, uh, well, switching from surface irrigation uh, to to a pump supply system, and, and by the way, uh, our pressurized irrigation systems, micro irrigation, um, they they uh, in order to take most make most beneficial use of that, the farmer needs to control the the timing and amount of when they run it. Uh, which can be a challenge with water supply, say, from an irrigation district, which has a, maybe a rigid water delivery schedule. So many times farmers will, will leave their irrigation district water and either put a new well in or use a well they've already got on the property. So there tends to be, we're seeing a lot of conversions, and some questions are coming up about, okay, is that a good thing or not? And when I say conversion, it's essentially converting from surface water to, to groundwater. Um, and we've got a lot of, uh, like across the country, we have a lot of intense uh, critical groundwater overdraft areas. And, you know, if we are providing financial assistance, you know, as we do throughout the state, and if some of our projects are located over in groundwater overdraft areas, uh, we need to ask the question, is, is should we be uh, encouraging or facilitating uh, the farmer switching to groundwater with our maybe a, a more efficient irrigation system? So we are actually are currently looking at that right now. We're gathering data, working with partners, and uh, it's very likely that we may have some policy changes. We may have you know, how we score and rank applications or how we advertise them uh, for the program that we consider that. Now, there are other alternatives. Um, perhaps we can uh, you know, work with the farmer on um, you know, if, uh, if debris and, and, and so forth in the surface water supply is the key issue. Uh, that, that he wants to avoid getting into a filter system that is that requires very very fine filtration, then maybe we can work with them and say, well, let's 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 look at uh, providing higher levels of cost or, or high, higher payment rate to to facilitate better better filtration. So that might be something we can look into. Uh, the other side is work continue to work with irrigation districts as they've done in California for many years is to continue to improve how the flexibility of how they deliver water to producers. And so we were very fortunate over the last two or three years to actually to partner with our with the Bureau of Reclamation um, in, in a few areas where they provide the uh, financial assistance to the irrigation districts to, to upgrade delivery systems to improve flexibility. And then we've worked with the producers on farm to take advantage of that flexibility. So that was a good example of a partnership with, uh, with the Bureau of Reclamation. But we need to be content. We need to look at these things, and that's why it's uh, it's important to check back once in a while and to see if we need to make policy or program delivery change. The uh, the other program check with uh, you know are we getting all we can out of the program? Uh, is it is there something an opportunity to to get more? Uh, you know, right now we are uh, providing a, a lot of financial assistance on on, uh, on hardware, and that's done a lot of good, no doubt, and we want to continue that. But we we'd ask ourselves, okay, is there more? And I want to back up a little bit. Um, there, you know, there's two. You probably most are aware. There's two two key things required to irrigate efficiently. Uh, first of all, as we've been talking about, uh, is, is the irrigation is the system itself. The, the system provides control, uniformity, and and so forth uh, on that side of things. But the second side, the second part, uh, is scheduling. You know, the farmer may have a brand new irrigation system out there, but if if, he, if they delay 
or if they irrigate too early or when they do irrigate, they maybe sometimes they have actually operated the system as they have surface systems and applying, over applying, then we're not getting, getting all the benefit we'd like to get. Uh, and, the, and the producer is not getting all the benefits. So irrigation scheduling is a key part, and that's something we need to, uh, we're, we will uh, like to kick up a notch, if you will, in California. Uh, within our CS irrigation scheduling, we, we tend to, it's, tends to fall into our conservation practice, as we call it, under Irrigation Water Management, or IWM, practice code 449, those that are familiar with it. And uh, so it's, that's, that's essentially how we, ever, how we uh, get irrigation scheduling applied is through that practice. Uh, put a level of importance on it. Um, this is no, this is no, no small thing. Um, you know, this get best estimates or from a little bit of information we have is you can expect 10 to 20 percent increased efficiency or water savings just by uh, perhaps making better irrigation decisions. Now, does it always in, uh, result in in applying less water? Well, no. We have situations where um, by doing better irrigation scheduling, the farmer discovers he's been under irrigating, and that's fine. Uh, you know, we don't try to isolate those out. We just our objective is to assist producers with improving control, including irrigation scheduling. So, irrigation scheduling and, and IWM, as, as I mentioned, uh, is, is important to us. But we have uh, we have to acknowledge, at least in our experience in California, we haven't been as successful as we'd like. Uh, to get full implementation of activities. And there's a number of reasons for that, and I won't go into all of them, but the large, largest one is as a, as a management practice, um, you know, there's less of a tangible uh, thing for the producer to see. You know, uh, when a farmer sees his brand new irrigation hardware out there, he, it's tangible. They see it and they value it. Um, uh, changing how he thinks about how he makes irrigation decisions is, is more challenging. Um, and so, and because of that, and this is other reasons, uh, we haven't been as successful as we'd like. So we're going to be looking for opportunities uh, to, to change that. Um, you know, again, we've been uh, assisting with hardware for many, many years and, and uh, have a very large hardware budget, if you will. But we're going to make some changes in California uh, to see if we can, uh, you know, elevate IWM and everything associated with it. Uh, to get more implementation, better scheduling. So it's soil moisture monitoring. It's uh, you know it's using weather stations. It's you know whatever it might be um, uh, to to make that change. And probably the biggest thing we need is essentially have more boots on the ground in working with farmers. Um, is that you saw earlier that we had 2,000 clients we worked with last year. And that, that's a lot of people. So uh, we're we're glad to do that, but we. Don't, um, the problem is we're short on staff, so we need to be more creative on how to reach more producers and, and, and that type of thing. So we'll be looking to uh, our partners, uh, TSPs, uh, technical service providers and consultants in private industry uh, to step in. And so part of our, uh, the approach is to work with them uh, to make sure they're on board with what we foresee, what we would call what is IWM. So in summary, um, you know, first of all, the, the EQIP program accelerates practice adoption. So it's it's something it's it's been a good thing, and we want to continue it. We're going to continue with the hardware, um, but we are going to we are going to kick it up a few several notches on on the management side, and, and it's across the board within NRCS all management practices. We're going to put a lot more emphasis on. Uh, secondly, is we need to continue to evaluate possible adverse impacts. You know, we, uh, again, as as we uh, assist a lot of farmers in the, in the state with, with irrigation hardware. We need to slow down a little bit at times and say, okay, is, is this working okay? Do we need to make some adjustments considering local conditions such as groundwater or overdraft? So it's important to take a look at that, and we are. Now, finally, is to, to look at the program to see is there an opportunity to, to increase benefits, and uh, you know, such as you know, tweaking the program, how we deliver it, uh, whether it be to increase uh, effective implementation of irrigation scheduling practices, or even taking advantage of that to to look at it, to um, uh, get more exposure for um, other practices such as you know soil health. Soil health within Cal within NRCS is, is very important right now, and we have a large initiative working on that. And in California, it's going to be a hard sell. 
but uh, we really truly think that a lot of our producers can benefit from, from soil health practices. And having the irrigation hardware and the irrigation system get our foot in the door, um, we need to take advantage of that. So that's my conclusion. I've, uh, uh, I've certainly, if you have any questions, please let me know or any ideas. You know, we, are, uh, we don't know everything. There's more we need to learn than we already know. So we'd like to get your input and thoughts, uh, either delivery to program uh, or irrigation scheduling. Uh, specific, you know, effective programs. We're very interested, so please don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, John, thanks. Dan, thanks a lot. So next up, we, and by the way, I know there's been a, a handful of questions that were asked. We're going to have all the questions. I'm taking note of all of them, and we're going to have a Q&A at the very end for both Dan and Dana. So keep the questions coming. If you have any additional for Dan, and as you listen to Dana's presentation, uh, be sure to pass on questions for her as well. So next up is Dana Gross. Dana is the conservation manager for the Silver Creek Watershed with the Nature Conservancy in, in Idaho. As I make her the presenter. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon in landscape architecture and a master's in recreation management and conservation from the University of Montana School of Forestry and has been with the Nature Conservancy in Idaho since 2004. So Dana, I want to throw it off to you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me all right, John? Hey, loud and clear. All right, good. I've got kind of a loud office, so I'll try and speak clearly. But, um, but one of the first things people always ask me when I talk about agriculture is, you work for the Nature Conservancy and you're involved in agriculture. And, um, you know, it's interesting because the way that we work, we have global programs. Um, we have country programs. We work in over 30 countries around the world. And then we have state programs. And some of our priorities, um, like some of our global priorities may not necessarily be state priorities and vice versa. With agriculture, we find that it is so integrated in all of our work around the world that we have it as a global priority, a North America priority, and an Idaho priority. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Nature Conservancy as a whole and how we work in agriculture, but to focus specifically on a project that I've been working on for the last couple of years in Idaho. Um, just to give you a little background, I saw a couple of people were from Idaho on the list, but not too many. So um, a very rural state, we have about one and a half million people, and a third of those live rurally. We're the third largest user of water in the U.S. behind Texas and California, and that water is primarily used for agriculture. Um, we also have the largest wilderness configuration in the continental United States, and more whitewater, um, raftable whitewater than anywhere in the U.S. So when when I talk about environmental conservation in Idaho, it's really hand in hand with agriculture. We're talking about protecting rivers and streams and open space and the rural values that we, that we appreciate in Idaho. It's just right, directly interlinked with um, agriculture. So here's a map of Idaho. You can see the Snake River Plain down here is primarily where our agricultural ground is. Oops, sorry. Um, and then we've got the large wilderness complex up here. This is Silver Creek, right in, in the middle of the state where I do most of my work. Uh-oh. Why is that not working? All right. Um, so this is a picture of Silver Creek. You can see it's a beautiful, it's a spring-fed creek in the middle of a high desert. We're surrounded by really rich agricultural ground. This is a big barley producing area for Miller Coors and Budweiser um, primarily. Um, really cold nights and, and nice warm dry days. Um, so it's the interesting thing, the this, this Silver Creek is kind of the epitome of nature conservancy and how we've worked and how we've sort of changed over the years. Um, this was our first project in Idaho. Uh, we got the preserve, which is about 900 acres now. And the way that we worked when we first started um, in conservation was to protect these really unique places, own the property, protect them, keep them sometimes open to the public, sometimes not, but largely bio, you know, richly diverse area is really unique, and that's exactly what Silver Creek is. Um, you don't see Spring Creek like this throughout very often. I mean, it's really an amazing place. Some of the highest densities of insects in the world, um, some of the highest densities of fish. So um, we started with owning the preserve, and then we qu quickly realized in order to protect the preserve, we needed to expand our work. And so we started doing conservation easements. And that's really how we've done a lot of our work in Idaho in agriculture is to protect these large open spaces. 
Um, in the 1990s, we started working on more stewardship-type projects, so fencing riparian areas. We did a lot of work in the Snake River. Oh, shoot. No. Um, we did a lot of work in the Snake River with um, treatment, wetland treatment um, uh, um, ponds at the end of, of, tributary, of uh, runoff that was going into the Snake River, and this is a picture of one here. Um, since then, we've kind of moved on to beyond sort of stewardship um, activities and into really practices, and that's what I'll talk about in this um, Idaho project that I'll get to in a minute. So the agricultural strategy, is, um, as John was mentioning at the beginning of the um, presentation, was our focus is keeping agriculture where it is in order over the years, we've protected all these very unique places, these really unusual, highly biodiverse, highly rich um, natural areas. And um, we want to ensure that those places remain protected. We're also realizing that you know, in the next 50 years, we're going to have to start producing a lot more crops and a lot more food for people all over the world. And so how do we do that while maintaining these really unique places? Um, well, we need to make those areas that are in agricultural more productive and more efficient and more sustainable. Um, so that's where our focus is globally, is what we're calling sustainable intensification, or more crop for the drop. And I don't know where that, where that came from, but it's kind of catchy. Um, so I'll talk specifically about this project in central Idaho. You can see the Silver Creek Preserve is down here. Um, in 2009, Miller Coors came to us and said, you know, we want to work with our supply chain and make it help the, help the farmers be more sustainable. We want to reduce our water footprint. We want to be more um, sensitive to um, the, the natural, you know, natural world. We want to just be more sustainable as a company. And so they said, do you, do you have any barley farmers you want to work with? Well, this preserve is surrounded by barley farmers. And luckily, we had a landowner who is really interested. I don't know why Doing that, really interested in um, working on a project with us. And they had a property right here, which is upstream of the preserve, and a property up here, which is um, um, also upstream of the preserve. So this is the valley, and the river actually runs out this way. You can see how it sloped this way. Well, most of the, the river actually hits porous sediment here and comes underground and has all that time to move through the underground. And when it hits these hills down here, it comes up in springs. And that's how Silver Creek is formed. So we're largely dependent, almost exclusively dependent on groundwater. And all of this agricultural area up here is irrigated by um, wells. And so the wells are pulling water out of the aquifer, which directly affects the flows in Silver Creek. And so the first thing we did when we started this project is we knew that water was an issue in Silver Creek. Flows have gone down over the years. The groundwater levels have gone down. We want to make sure that it has enough flows to sustain the ecosystem. So we did a groundwater model, groundwater and surface water model that showed um, we wanted to see if we were to if we were to make some substantial um, conservation uh, changes in the upper valley where all the wells are, so up in this area, um, what would those changes do to Silver Creek? And you can see these little springs down here. This is Silver Creek. Um, so this is 10% water savings. You can start. This is in meters. You can start to see the groundwater come up, maybe a foot or so, if we did. 10% water savings across that, the, what, we're, what we call is the Bellevue Triangle. As you get to 20 and 30%, you start to see the groundwater come up anywhere from 4 to 6 feet. And then the same thing down here, alfalfa to barley and alfalfa to grass, which is essentially um, just a water saving. But you start to see changes in the aquifer, which is what we like to see for Silver Creek. So the Showcase Barley Farm, what we decided to do, and this was um, what Mark Miller Coors was really interested in doing was having one farm where we developed a list of best management practices working with the farmer, um, some things that he thought could improve, what did we as the Nature Conservancy want to see, more biodiversity, you know, water quality. Um, so we worked hand in hand with the farmer and we came up with a list of best management practices. And the idea was to implement as many of these practices as we could on one farm so that um, Miller Coors and other people that were interested in doing similar things could come see the farm and talk to the farmer and learn more about the practices. So in the upper part where I showed you on the earlier slide, this, this part of the property is up in here. So where there's a lot of, all these are well, um, uh, these are all pumped from wells. Um, we did a lot of irrigation changes, and they were simple irrigation changes. This was a lot of flat ground, pretty similar soils, 
Um, so we turned off some end guns. Some in some of these places where the end guns um, were shut off, we actually planted native habitat. You'll see these little bird things or bird boxes. Uh, we did raptor poles because we had some pretty serious vole problems. Um, we changed out all the nozzles on all of the pivots, and you can see this is a picture. This is a yield picture of a pivot with an old nozzle package. And the yield, the the orange and the yellow and the red are lower yields, and the blue and the green are higher yields. And from this pivot, we figured that they had lost about 10 to 15 percent of their yield for the year. And this pivot package had been on this in this bad of shape for several years. So that's quite a substantial amount of um, money lost over the years. Um, and this is Gary. This is our, our farmer. And he <laughs> was very, um, very nice to work with. It literally was a crash course in farming because Miller Coors also wanted to get this all done in one year. So we started in the, in the winter, implemented everything in the spring, measured through the summer, and were essentially done by the next winter. Um, having said that, the, the family has been really interested in this project, and so we've continued to do a lot of um, things on their property. This is the lower part, and you can start to see these right here are little springs that are coming up and forming Silver Creek. This is a large wetland complex. Most of this ground was sub-irrigated, so we didn't make a lot of irrigation changes. We really focused on the habitat, and this is organic down here, so we we're working a lot with weed control and trying some, some techniques to deal with weed control, like cross-planting. Um, this is uh, Patton Creek, which is one of the main tributaries to Silver Creek. So we did a lot of planting here. Um, these are wildlife corridors where we changed the fences, where the wildlife corridors were for wildlife-friendly fencing. Um, so a lot more sort of biodiversity focus down here. We did some pollinator plantings. Um, but again, lots of bird boxes, and these are just showing some of the, we built a lot of birdhouses, planted a lot of plants, and you can see along the riparian areas there's some nice willows coming up. So a variety of things all in one year, and this was, um, this is showing a different property, but we did try um, some experimental variable rate irrigation systems. Um, Again, these were this was a pivot that went across the creek. So we, we you know we did a variable rate irrigation system where we actually changed out each one of these and put a valve at the end of the droppers. Very expensive, but for this property, ended up saving I think it was 20% of their water, and they had it um, uh, combined with a variable frequency drive on their pump. So they ended up saving a lot of money in power. Um, so what we found on the Barley Showcase Farm, which has been really exciting and, and um, successful with Miller Coors, we've had many tours out there, and um, it's really getting people out and talking about these things, what worked and what didn't work, how we did it, what kind of funding we used. So we did use some NRCS funding, um, as Dan mentioned earlier. We, we actually um, uh, had that kind of that ball rolling before this project started. We used a lot of um, Idaho Power rebate funding, which was really um, incredibly helpful, and then Miller Coors and the Nature Conservancy also contributed. But what we found was some of the most simple things um, were the most effective. So taking the end guns off in certain places where Gary wasn't getting the, um, the yield, uh, taking those end guns up and ended up saving them half. So he went from $50 an acre in his power bill to $25 an acre on his power bill. and ended up being cost neutral. So he didn't have to deal with um, farming and taking care of those acres. He just took them out of production and, and really didn't lose anything. And we also gained something there from the Nature Conservancy standpoint as we um, planted them with native plants or native flowering plants for pollinators and wildlife. So you get kind of um, the best of both worlds with some of the really simple things. Um, taking it to scale, so what we'd like to do is to take the what we learned on the showcase farm and really scale it up. And working with the NRCS has been one of the, the big things for us, being the boots on the ground where we can for the NRCS. Like Dan, Dan mentioned, what we found in our neck of the woods is, is there, aren't, there just aren't enough people out there to, you know, letting landowners know about projects, letting landowners know about programs. Um, so being, being that kind of... Um, boot on the ground, essentially. Um, and we actually are working on being technical resource advisors for the NRCS. So working more closely um, to get these, these things implemented on a larger scale so we can have a bigger effect. Um, we also found that working with corporations, so the sustainability and the supply chain is, is so important now. They're, you know, companies are actually being rated um, by how sustainable their supply chains are. So if there's anything we can do helping the corporations figure out 
what that means, how to measure it, um, whether the things that they're implementing actually are producing the results we're, we're looking for and they're looking for. Um, we're looking at working in a large scale with corporations to kind of figure those things out as, as this, this sustainability really becomes important as we go forward. And then working with Idaho Power, Northwest Energy Co uh, Alliance to promote and develop incentives for energy saving practices, um, which often are, you know, in our case with, with wells pumping water, um, also the same thing that's saving water. Um, so going forward, we're actually trying some new technologies. Um, we've, we haven't totally moved on from the showcase farm, but we have several farmers that are interested in doing similar things. So we're looking at more cost-effective ways of doing the um, variable rate irrigation. And this is a prescription for a field based on soil and slope, um, where it's just a matter of speeding up and slowing down the pivot. And this is all based on statistical analysis. So it's um, it's it's much, much cheaper, that, that pivot I showed before. For these, you're looking at a couple of thousand for the whole, for the whole thing. Um, and working with NRCS to see, you know, get these, these types of new technologies in their queue for funding. Um, so in the, in the big picture, we're looking to substantially decrease water and energy and substantially increase productivity. And I would add into that, we're also looking at increasing biodiversity and pollinator habitat and, and, and improving soil health. So there's a lot of things that go into making a farm more sustainable. For the farmer, obviously, the incentive is the higher yield with the lower energy costs and lower inputs and less water use, um, and working with the farmers to make sure that they're getting all of their needs met is really important to us. Um, and so that's, this is, <laughs> Dan wanted to show his hands. I like to actually put a name to the face when I'm doing these things. So if we run into each other at a conference or something, come up and say hi. But this is uh, myself and my son standing in Silver Creek, and certainly not last week since it was, I think, negative 15. But um, so that's all I have for, for you today. Um, but like Dan, we're always learning, and we're always changing, and we're always coming up with new projects. So if anybody has any thoughts or ideas, um, you know, the Nature Conservancy is working on a lot of projects like this through the West. We've got projects in Colorado and California and Nebraska. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about how we work with farmers on the ground um, to improve their, their um, practices and also to help um, conserve the things that we've worked so long to protect, um, just give me an email or drop me a phone call. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. So. We are going to now move on to our question and answer period. And I'm going to go ahead and start back up my presentation here. And on the screen right now is all of our email addresses and content information. We have a lot of questions here, and I'm not going to get to all of them. I can promise you that. But I will share all these questions with the presenters themselves. So if you do have a question that was specific for one presenter, they will get that question, or I also encourage you to reach out to them directly. Once we're done with the Q&A period, I also have a, a special announcement that we'd like to make regarding the 2014 webinars, which I hope you can stick around and, and listen to. Hope to wrap up here in the next uh, 10 minutes or so as well. So I'm going to go back to Dan for the first question. Um, we, have, we have one question about someone who's talked with a lot of producers who've had challenges with the equip time frame and uncertainty in the amount of cost share, and wanted you to comment on your thoughts regarding that. Yeah, that, this, uh, that, that challenge or question comes up uh, fairly regularly in, in regards to um, you know how producers uh, their schedule, how they make you know, between the work and the system, the producers, and if they work with a consultant or a vendor, um, the scheduling and timing. Uh, of those those interactions, and which is all important, especially with their, when they're trying to run a business, and we're very well aware of that. It's been brought to our attention, and I guess you know we've we've adjusted it nationally. This is a, uh, the, the schedule is kind of set nationally as far as how funds are rolled out and the process we we have to go through to spend them wisely. Um, so it's it's this is something I. You know, I don't have a good, I don't have an, a, a, a resolution for you, um, other than patience. Uh, what we encourage producers to do is to uh, more and more is to plan ahead. Um, you know, as far as maybe you know, anticipate what you want to do one or two years ahead of time, 
and work with NRCS early to get the you know a conservation planning as part of our process to maybe to, to do that first. And uh, um, but otherwise, you know, we we're at the whim of Congress and when they release budgets and, and those kind of bureau, bureaucratic things. So I you're probably not going to like my answer, but that's about the best I could do. But this has been it has been a challenge, and that's not the first week we've heard about it. Yeah, whenever you mention relying on Congress, I think being a challenge <laughs> goes hand in hand in the same statement, Dan. Yeah, so uh, but and we, and we and I'll tell you, we have adjusted. Um, in California, you know, the, our state conservationist, our big boss for each, in each state, uh, has some flexibility, uh, limited flexibility, but they've adjusted, you know, when we've had cut-up dates, sign-up dates for the program, those kind of things, to better enable uh, farmers to get, you know, the program started within uh, the decision-making time they'd like to have. So, but it's, I know it's not, it's not perfect yet. Uh, Dana, we, we, I, I'm going to kind of uh, bring some questions into one here and uh, and talk a little about when you either approach a producer or a producer approach, approaches you about uh, upgrading an irrigation system either on your um, the farm, your example farm that you talked about, or in future projects, get the upfront cost of either removing the end gun or implementing variable rate irrigation on a pivot. But are there any questions or concerns about what happens one, two, three years down the road if any kind of service is needed and expertise is needed then? Does the Nature Conservancy continue to help the producer out, or, or how, is that something you agree upon on the, on the front end, or, or how does that work? Well, usually these are producers that we have um, pretty long-term relationships with. I mean, not not all of them, of course, but um, but where I you know, where I am, um, we're, we're out in the field in the, in the field a lot, and so a lot of these are long-term relationships. And we certainly help. We're not necessarily the technical um, experts, and so we wouldn't, you know, help them figure troubleshoot their irrigation system. But we certainly help people find the right people to talk to. Um, and as far as an ongoing kind of maintenance, we try really hard to continue the relationship. So these we look at them as projects. You know, they are. We try and take it to scale, and hopefully we'll we'll get it to a bigger scale. But um, we are involved in them in long, the long term, and so if we work on one project one year, you know, maybe five years down the road, and something else comes up or a grant opportunity comes up, I always have these people in mind that we've worked with and our priority areas in mind. So um, they're long-term relationships. They're you know some of them are sh are shorter than others, obviously, but we try really hard to be there as far as. Um, technical help and finding the right people and grant opportunities and, and letting them know some of the deadlines, like the NRCS deadlines. And um, so, yeah, we try and be involved after the in first kind of implementation. And, and this question is for both of you. Um, and I guess, Dan, you first. When talking with producers and their decision to go and work with NRCS through an equip cost share or grant, is it is a driving factor? Is it financial to them? Is it regulatory concern? Is it a combination? What 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 is that driving factor that you that, you, that you've seen in, in your conversations? It's uh, in in uh, in the past, in the recent past in California, it, it's been uh, producers have seen uh, benefit to them from a production standpoint, um, and or a convenience standpoint. You know they've uh, they've recognized that uh, your surface irrigating you know it takes a lot of labor and, and it's and it's uh, you know and he's struggling with uh, moving labor around getting this, those kind of things so if they uh, one of the benefits is you can go to a system that's more automatic automated or self self operated uh, they like that um, but we we are seeing change in that as I mentioned we have there, we have an irrigated lands initiative in the state of California, which is essentially it's a regulatory program to look at water quality. And farmers are starting to respond to that. Uh, uh, what's happening is uh, they're, they're seeing uh, water quality issues off-site, uh, starting uh, emanating from farms, and farmers are saying, are being instructed, okay, you need to do something. So we're seeing more producers uh, come in and say, okay, I've, I've been told I need to get a handle on my tailwater. You know, can you, do you have, what do you have to offer? So that's that's just growing, but you know, by and large, the majority of it uh, is farmers deciding from a production standpoint that these these systems make sense, and so uh, that's how we're kind of tweaking our, our you know we're seeing these, some of these systems are becoming more popular 
So we're trying to decide, okay, how do we glam onto that? Say, well, these they're going to be installing these by, by themselves anyway. How can we add on to that? And uh, in regards to, say, more irrigation scheduling become part of it. Mm -hmm. So long answer. No, that's fine. D Dana, how about same question for you? Yeah, I would say the same. It's really a lot about efficiency right now. Um, we are looking at a, um, in, um, implementing conjunctive management in our valley, though, where groundwater rights and surface water rights will be managed together. So a lot of our groundwater pumpers are not going to have um, the water that they have now. And so the efficiencies will um, become even more important. But at this point, it's largely about being more efficient and more productive and um, being able to get everything done um, on time, and, and they're just, you know, like Dan said, these systems just make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And Dan, I've seen your email address written two ways. Is that is that a way to get in touch with you on the screen right now? Um, it's actually Dana. Yeah, it's D-A-Y-N-A -A underscore gross at tnc.org. So. Okay, because that's the one. Of the I, think a, I think there's a, I think there's a Dan, I think there's a Dan oh, really? Gross out there that might get a lot of email. Okay. Yeah, this, uh, on, that's what was on the TNC website, so I apologize for that. So D A Y N A underscore gross at TNC.org? Yep, that's right. Okay, okay, good. All right. So um, I know that a lot of you had questions. We're up at three o'clock right now. It's three oh one. So I want to I want to continue to move on and we will get to uh, a lot of the other questions later on uh, through personal interaction with presenters. But I wanted to talk about next year's webinars as well. And all of you will get this schedule emailed to you uh, later on, but I wanted to first get this on your radar for next year as well. You also see that we've introduced some turf and landscape focused webinars as well. Each of these webinars will begin at 2 o'clock Eastern time, and we have one during each month except for August, September, and November so of next year. So if you're interested in any of these topics, I encourage you to stay in touch with us and, and participate. If there are any suggestions on future webinars, please feel free to let me know. And additional information about these webinars and the recording of this webinar will be available on that uh, website that's on the screen right now. And with that, I want to say thank you to Dan and thank you to Dana. It was great presentations. And thank you to all of you for listening in. And I hope to see you again on our webinar in 2014. Thank you very much. Thank right, you. Thank you.